I'm the A in the APB of Chuck Augustowski. The original company was also started by John Petroselli and Paz Vogel. We do not design in a vacuum. We try to keep ourselves as open as possible. The future of APB is most definitely digital controlled analog. So that's a huge announcement, and I am incredibly excited to have Mr. Chuck Augustowski on the channel today to share the history of APB, what they're doing now, and where they're going next in his own words. Chuck recently partnered with Bill Coons of Contact Distribution, and he's been a good friend of the channel for a number of years now. Bill and I became friends when he reached out back in 2017 after seeing one of my videos, and he is an absolute encyclopedia of history when it comes to the pro audio industry, especially here in North America, and he really gets what this channel is all about. Leading up to the NAMM show, Bill thought I should meet Chuck personally so I could help share the story of APB here with everyone on the channel. Just so we're all on the same page, I'm incredibly proud to have had APB support in making this video and my other NAM videos possible this year. Both Bill and Chuck gave me absolutely unlimited access to APB for both questions and resources like photos to include in this video, uh, and neither of them had any interest in telling me what to say or include. I look forward to being able to share their progress with you here and to look at their gear together with you as it becomes available. Personally, I've been a fan of APB since they formed the brand. At the time, back in 2005, I was working with my good friend and pro audio review writer, Andrew Roberts, when he got one of the early ProRack house uh, mixers in to review. And in the running gun press conference and corporate world of Washington, DC, it quickly became our go-to small console of choice. Uh, he still deploys that console to this day on certain jobs. So it, very, very good consoles. Anyone who knew the history of the engineering work leading from Allen and Heath to the success they had at Crest consoles to their forming of APB knew that this was something special at the time. I mean, engineers don't just go out and start a console company. How the heck does that even happen, honestly? Well, APB was a company that we started in 2000, December of 2004. Uh, APB, uh, the A, I'm the A in the APB of Chuck Augustowski. The original company was also started by John Petroselli and Paz Vogel. Unfortunately, we lost uh, JP about two years ago uh, and miss him quite bad. The big change at the show with APB is we are under new ownership. The original company was started on a shoestring. It was the three of us. Each one of us owned 20% and we had one investor. Uh, when things got really bad in the industry in 2012, quite honestly, you could not give analog away. And uh, we basically allowed our investor to have the whole company back and he continued to support the company. It was very fortunate because since 2012, we have seen a slow increase an interest in analog in reference to live performance. It has been much faster in the recording side of it, and the good side is we can look at what's happening there, and it gives us a little bit inspiration as to where we could find ourselves going. And especially in that sound contracting market, uh, these guys understand audio, they understand what high level of control that they have, and we're trying to design a product for that type of market. You have to have a center point, and in our case, it is sound contracting, and it is the sound contractors we speak to, probably a little bit more than the, pro, uh, than the Turing guys, but we speak to everybody. We're trying to find out what people are looking for, and we do pay attention to what other manufacturers are doing, but we don't let that be our guide. It's the customer is our guide. We. In our design work, I like to say that we do not design in a vacuum. We try to keep ourselves as open as possible. It doesn't mean that because someone says, I want to see this feature, you're going to see that feature. But if I hear you know, a lot of people looking for a particular thing or not liking something that we do, I take it much more seriously and it directly affects what we're doing in, in the, on future products. Okay, the question just came up as to what products we're starting with uh, initially here. We're starting with all of the products that we ended with when the company got purchased. Uh, that is the, the uh, Pro Spec line, 
uh, that consists of a version that is four mono, four stereo into left, right, and center. It's designed to be operate as either a mono, stereo, or work in an LCR environment. Uh, again, it's mainly a sound reinforcement product of the sound reinforcement series, but we see, I've seen a lot of people using our units as their mic breeze uh, at the head end of a record, for, a rec for a recording application. Again, we as a manufacturer can't really dictate where our products get used. And though we are designing them as sound reinforcement products, the customers are quite imaginative where they use it, and we find our products being used in all type of applications, even all the way to being the head end of a intercom system in one case. So the, the first one is an eight input mono microphone input, all again using Burr Brown mic pre's, that corporation out smart chips, all of them using our standard circuitry. We do not like electrolytic capacitors on any of our products. You know, we do have a capacitor in there that is bypassed with Mylar caps at the front end to make sure we don't pass DC. But other than that, we're looking for minimal phase shift. Like I said, the reference is that piece of, of uh, wire and a capacitor does not sound like a piece of wire. Next up in the line is a version, same unit, four mono, four stereo, same one U package. Then there's a two U package that is six mono and two stereo. The difference is this does use a continuously variable high pass filter and simple high and low frequency EQ added to it. Also gives you additional matrix outputs and built-in limiters on the output. Again, the main focus is the sound contractor. In fact, that particular piece, we originally called it the high school mixer. And uh, the goal here was that it'd be easy for a school teacher to handle. We knew that the, the, the students could handle it. We weren't so sure about the teacher being able to, to, to handle it. Uh, the final piece is actually an expansion of the Mix Switch series called the Mix Switch C. It's actually part of the same family. It is basically a stripped down mix switch that only offers the ability to, as it gets very noisy in here, uh, build, sick them. A four in by four in by four output device, single switch on the front to select between input A, input B, or input A plus B. And then also, if you were to plug into the remote connector on the rear, it could, and it's meant to act as the expander to a standard mix switch. So if you're doing a monitor console, let's say with 24 uh, outputs, you would use one master mix switch and add on uh, mix switch C's to give you the extra switching capabilities of multiple channels. The mix switch, uh, we've actually had this thing out for quite a few years. Uh, uh, it's been adopted by many major sound companies. Uh, it is totally an analog unit. Uh, it basically is a four in by four in by four out device. You would think that that is the main interest on, for sound companies. But what we found is what seems to interest them more is that we have also given it additional abilities that it uh, has a microphone input channel with connectors on both fr on a front and rear panel, but most importantly, it has its own EQ and compressor circuitry on it and the ability to send signal to that left and right as well as you can decide if it's also going to the center and to the subwoofer. You know, uh, and I also have to say, we're saying center, but it, I like to say it's going to C and that could either be center or it could be the uh, st uh, near field speakers on the stage. So anything that you want to use it, customers will uh, the, the decide on it. Well, okay, the, 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 the most significant product for a couple of reasons. One, it has uh, been our best seller since its introduction, uh, is the ProRack House. Uh, the ProRack House, is a 16 channel, 20 microphone preamp mixer that has four subgroups. Every input channel has insert points. Every output channel has insert points and balanced bus inputs into it, which means that it's very easy to link units together. In fact, on the rear, it has a solo linking system. So if you took two units to, and hooked them together, a lot of the hooking together is, is conventional. There's no multi-pin connector, but we also have a separate linking system for the solo systems. So when you do, do, do a full link, it really does act like a single console. And we do have customers who are operating uh, as, as that. Uh, it is 
derived from the original Spectra console, as is really all of the products. And the key thing is that it's all direct couple design. We hate those electrolytic capacitors. We just don't like their sounds. Uh, some people think they sound warm. In fact, that is the advantage of capacitors. Uh, it, it, you, if you listen to a mixer that has capacitors, it doesn't sound like a piece of wire. It's, it always has a warmer sound. Unfortunately, that warmer sound is the distortion that the capacitors are doing. Our definition, by the way, of distortion is any variation from the original sound. We go by the te textbook description of it, meaning that an EQ section is a distortion device, a compressor is a distortion device. We don't have anything against it, but we always try to make sure you have that pure signal route from input to output. And then, rather than a unit sounding warm on its own, you have to add the warmth with the EQ section. So we want the customer, the engineer, the artist, to have the choice. Uh, listen, we're fanatical over the sounds of, of the pieces. And the other thing we're fanatical on is the reliability of the, of the pieces. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. I've been through three companies. The you know, first was a long-term relationship at, from the very beginning of Allen & Heat that went all the way to 81. When the company got sold to Harman, uh, we became friends with John Lee, who owned Crest Audio, and he convinced us to start our next console company under the umbrella of Crest Audio, becoming Crest Consoles. That was actually the most successful of all of the companies. And in fact, it was actually John who really taught me how to listen to customers to understand what kind of feature sets it should have. Prior to that, it was like a lot of my own ideas. The reality is I have done live sound for more than 12 years at the beginning of my career. Uh, I've spent time in a studio working with some major artists and major producers. The reality though is I don't do that anymore. So I'm not, I, the, the lesson I learned a long time ago is I'm not designing products for me. I have to listen to customers. I'm designing it for them. I have to try to get them as close as I can to what they're looking for. One of the things, fortunately, I've learned a long time ago is to listen to multiple people and be able to sort out what they're saying. So if one person asks for a given feature and I only hear it from one person, you're probably not gonna see that on the product. But if I get a majority of people saying they're looking for a given type of feature or a different type of operation, eventually that tends to filter into the console. That has been always the way I have worked. But working under John Lee, he really taught me how to do that. And I am very thankful for him for giving me that lesson. One of the first projects that has actually already gone, been turned over to engineering in the last four weeks is a product called Mix Switch Hybrid. So I'm giving you a little bit of a preview of where it's going to. It's a 2U unit, and now it has analog inputs and outputs, AES EBU inputs and outputs, and Dante inputs and outputs. Uh, what's obvious on it is it's designed, to, it looks like it's designed to, and it is designed to switch between four consoles, but there's other facilities that if you had to, you could plug in up to eight, up to seven consoles into the unit. So that handles the switching thing, but again, our customers have been more excited in some of the other features, especially, not, this product isn't only for the Turing market, it's also for the install market. And both are interested in the extra features. What the extra features are now, it has two microphone input channels with separate EQ on each one of them. So now, between sets, if you have two DJs that want to banter at the front of house console and kind of entertain while you're going through a set change, you've got the microphone inputs there that are independent of any external console. You have the stereo program input for your music playback. The stereo, the, what's labeled as stereo program input is a quarter inch balanced uh, RCA input and USB input into it. So that is mainly meant for music playback though it could be used for more. And then a general line input section that has XLR balanced inputs, Dante inputs, and AES EBU. And this also has e EQ section on it. The whole unit, we've, while we've always liked doing things in fours, doing basically left, right, C, and M, center and, and mono, we know that customers are not necessarily operating with center speakers or even with separate subwoofer outputs. So what we've done on this unit here, especially if you're working with multiple consoles, we have a miniature matrix built into the unit. So now all channels on the unit assigned to left and right, but into the C bus and into the M bus, 
uh, we have both assignment switches and level controls. So now you can take a left and right output of a console and s generate a separate subwoofer send or that uh, monitor, separate uh, near field system from it, from all of our inputs. So it's a very advanced unit. Like I said, it's digital input uh, and output and Dante input and input. All summing though is in the analog domain. So this is still very much what our basis of doing analog consoles. Again, the advantage of doing it that way, no truncating of words, it's, it's pure analog. You know, it's, you know we, we, we like the sound of analog, we think many of our customers do. Some customers will like digital, They're, fortunately there is competition for it, and some people may go one way or the other, we invite both ways, but we're, we're making sure that you, the customer can, have, on all of our types of products, have some options beyond just purely digital. You know, the Pro Rack, a lot of people have said it's the most features anybody has ever seen in that amount of space. Uh, I'm happy to say that in the future of APB, I'm going to get a lot more features in that same amount of space, but it's also going to be easier to operate. The future of APB in reference to all of our products is going to be digital controlled analog. It will not be the first that you'll see, but there will be a ProRack hybrid at some time in the future that has all of the capabilities of the current ProRack house. I don't think there'll be anything that's missing on it. It will also have all of the capabilities of the ProRack, uh, short-lived ProRack monitor. For those interested, the reason why the ProRack monitor has such a short life was uh, the, the, the console depended upon 10 millimeter faders for panning. Uh, and there was like about 150 of these in a 10U rack mount piece. And shortly, within six months after we started shipping these, the manufacturer discontinued them because of the new Rojas regulations. And no other manufacturer was willing to take that on that part. So we had a very successful product that only had a six month life. Uh, you'll continue to see conventional products. They're not going away, they'll all be analog. And some of the most basic, you know, our little eight by three mixer that we have, one U. But you're also at some very early point going to see a one U digital controlled analog mixer that in addition to being controlled totally within itself, also will be capable of being controlled from an external iPad type of device. The adva big advantage of digital has been recallability. We feel that that can be brought back into analog we have a good background as part of our early history with Crest Audio. Jim Gamble was part of that team. And Jim took on major digital control analog and to us is kind of one of the pioneers of digital control analog. And, and we have great respect from him. We learned a lot from him back, back in those days. And in fact, a very good thing that happened both in our Crest days that continued into our APB days is John Petroselli and Jim used to evaluate each other's circuitry uh, and offer advice to each other to see if it could be improved. Always trying to improve the product. We learned a long time ago that you can take a given set of, of parts, hand it to six different people, and each one with exactly the same parts will sound different. So they very much learned that the layout was very critical and very small changes can make very big difference in the sonic characteristic of a product. By the way, I should add that uh, we do have a very sonic, uh, very definite sonic signature. And that signature is a piece of wire. That is our reference for everything that we're doing and is very much our reference when we're doing digital controlled analog. The future hybrid will be able to have, will have all of the capabilities of the ProRack monitor uh, which would make all the in the ear guys very happy. It is very much aimed at, a, as a console, the whole concept is something you carry underneath the bus, artists able to carry it themselves. Obviously it's a front of house console, but it's also a monitor console, including a full built-in splitter system, giving away a little bit on, on the piece. But uh, again, it's a digital controlled analog piece entirely. And in addition to the hardware portion, Again, you'll be able to control the thing from an external uh, iPod type of uh, de device. Uh, but that, you know, anything else I say is giving away a little bit too much. Everything I'm describing, it's basically a four-year plan. Some of the products you'll see very soon, some of them may take a full four years. When we're talking about digital control analog, I have a very strong belief that 
somebody who knows how to mix should never have to refer to an owner's manual. And I consider that if someone has to go into an owner's manual to figure out how to use one of our products, I have failed. We're not necessarily following the digital crowds. You're gonna find stuff on our digital control services that they do that became natural. Again, we're responding to the customer's response, but I think it, it, the final product, uh, well, the customer will have new options that he's not had before. And I'm not even saying we're right on any of these. Some of, uh, we, we would find ourselves doing things very wrong, but what we're gonna do is be able to give the customer options. We have great respect for the guys that are out there and their products are always gonna keep selling and I myself will probably someday even use their products. But, you know, again, it's that alternative thing we want to do for our customers. We're not anti-digital, we are pro-audio. Well, I don't know if it's totally unique. I mean, if you look at, especially the work of someone like Rupert Neve, I mean, uh, you know, to us, Rupert Neve is God. Uh, so, uh, we're not using the same type of tech topographies, but it's kind of like the inspiration for a lot we're doing. Uh, a lot of the early work done by you know some wonderful people out there has been the inspiration kind of what we're doing uh, we especially John Petroselli and you know though we've lost John Petroselli you know two years ago in fact exactly two years ago because he passed away two years ago while we were while I was at this show uh, you know John is the inspiration to what we're doing he, he, he is still part of this company and we'll never forget that but I actually do have some electrical backgrounds and all, but I've always been surrounded by engineers that are so much better than I. Uh, so I'm probably a, a wrong person to ask this, but I can tell you that John started with the Burr Brown device on it, and then he and Taz Bogle, and the two of them are equal, were equal partners in this, uh, designed additional circuitry on it. They did not, they weren't satisfied with just that chip. At this point, we're sticking to the original Burr Brown that John and Taz uh, really developed. Remember, no electrolytic capacitor. There is a capacitor in there, but it's designed so that it will not dry out over time. Any kind of long-term uh, deterioration is made up by additional mylar caps on it. They, they, they looked into the long-term life on it, on all of our product. By the way, that's also a general advantage of not using electrolytics in general, is uh, all electrolytics dry up over time, some more than, than others. By not having them, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, there should be no change in the sound uh, of, of, of our unit. But the fact that we don't use the electrolytics through our EQ section or the mic pre or all the way through there is part of what gives the mic pre its sonic characteristic. That sonic characteristic, again, as close as we could get to a piece of wire. Well, we are diving into digital, but in a totally different way. We're, you know, digital control of things. Uh, it's more expensive, I have to tell you that. We're not trying to build a low cost piece here. We're trying to build a professional uh, unit. One thing about I think about our products and that we're very aware of is return on investment. So you will pay more probably for our pieces than some other digi purely digital pieces, but hopefully, only time will tell on this one, uh, you know, there's no reason why something like a Pro Rack House won't be working 10, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, you know, will digital? Well, hopefully it will, but you know, who knows? I'm talking about a specific digital piece that someone would buy. I know our stuff will work for a very, very long period of, of, of time. So yeah, we're very much into digital. It's just a different kind of digital. Even though I said I'm not an engineer for a while, I did work with military electronics in the late 60s, early 70s. So I guess I'm giving away my age a little bit there. Uh, what I worked on, believe it or not, was analog computers. Uh, and I was able to see a lot what analog computers could do. And I think that in the next 20, 30 years, we're gonna see a major shift on what we consider digital. I mean, you know, quite honestly, what we're considering analog now may eventually be called digital, but that digital is really analog. It, it, it's very strange what may happen in the future. None of us know. All I can say is our signal pads and specifically our signal pads will be analog. There will be exceptions, because quite honestly, if I have uh, my, uh, uh, there will be a product, some products that have stage racks in the front of house. To get signal back to the monitor system in the front of house, I do have to bring it back in a digital form. I, the last thing I want to do is try to bring an analog signal back, but that is purely for monitoring or headphone monitoring for, for the engineer. 
Okay, the question was is how easy is the uh, ProRack to service? And this is the, the topography we use on all of our units. Even the 1U unit uses a very similar topography. We're using a passive motherboard. It contains near no active circuitry. All of the active circuitry is on small modules. On the upper section here, this module here is the microphone preamplifier and the EQ section. If there were a problem with this, I undo uh, the locking pin. We just simply just uh, just a piece of uh, circuit board material that is locked to the front uh, chassis itself. You remove that because the last thing we want is in transport for this unit to come come loose in any way. Uh, once that's off, just a matter of pulling the module and putting a new one in. Reason we did this: our products are sold worldwide. If something went bad on the other side of the world, we'd much rather simply send just a replacement circuit board in an overnight envelope than have to bring the thing into the shop to re repair. Uh, same thing down here. This is all the drive electronics on the lower section. Uh, again, all, your, your fader drive, all the aux drives are on that particular circuit board. On the rear panel, uh, the, there's a circuit board further back. That's where all the connectors are mounted. But this contains all of the electronics, so to replace that, just a matter of undoing the two connectors, this is the DC and this is signal, uh, undo the couple screws that hold it in place and just pop it off and put, put a new one back in place. So it really is designed to be easy to service. The best place to follow what's going al <laughs> along is just keep your eye on the press. Uh, we do have a Facebook page. We've added Bill Coons, who is uh, contact distribution, who, uh, because we're no longer manufacturing the product in the U.S., I have to admit the product is being manufactured in China, but it's being manufactured true to the original product to the point when they sent us, us the first samples. I opened up the units and got very upset and actually went back to them saying, why are you sending us units that you took from New Jersey? It turns out those units were brand new. I could not tell the difference on the units. You know, everybody is agreeing, no, you can't change parts that you're using. It's got to be the original parts. Uh, you know, follow our Facebook page. Hopefully we'll be able to give you information on it. This new company is much more prepared. We're building product in larger batches than we were before. There are more people involved in the quality control portion of the thing. I have a feeling you're going to be asking enough questions in the future uh, as to how we're doing on this and what's the progress on it. So I would say one of the best sources will be where you're watching right now. Thanks for sticking around for the whole video. And thanks again to Chuck for being so generous with his time and all the stories he was willing to share. We will be seeing more of him and Bill too uh, for future conversations for sure. And we will absolutely be looking at APB's gear as each piece becomes available in the near future. Thanks again to APB, Pro Soundweb, Lectrosonics, and all of the individual supporters who made this year's NAM coverage possible. I have more videos from the show coming very soon. Uh, visit dcsoundop.com and sign up for the email newsletter if you haven't already done so, so you don't miss a video. I'll see you next time.